I'm ready to go. How about you? Woo! That was wonderful. I tell you what, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Please be seated. We're glad to see each and every one of you this morning as we come together here in God's house to worship, praise, and exalt his matchless name. And it's an exciting day because this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice in it. So let me welcome you. Hey, you know, every day, I, I like probably a lot of you, on my phone, I get this, I have this little app that tells me, it gives me the verse of the day, okay? And I was reminded this morning about how blessed we are as the people of God. The verse of the day today is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness? or danger or sword and it just kind of leaves you there hanging and if you go and look at your bible you know the end of the story says knowing all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us and we're so grateful for that because that's the victory that we have in jesus and we celebrate him today so as we gather together in worship lift up your hearts and praise consider the just the joy that it is to be able to celebrate jesus and experience his power and grace in our lives and as he l speaks to you listen to what he has to say and ask him to lead you in the place of righteousness for his name's sake and find the joy that is living in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to lead us as we worship together. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today. We're grateful and thankful, Lord, for all of the things that you do for us, all of the blessing that you bring to our lives. And we ask, dear Jesus, now that you'll just lead us and direct us as we worship you this morning. Lift our hearts to you, Lord. Give us that courage, that readiness, that willingness to do that. And Father, I pray that you'll receive our worship joyfully, because with all of our hearts and all of our soul and all of our mind, we love you. We love you deeply. Take hold of this time, God, for your glory and honor. It's in your pray name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, sure, I'm glad to see all you guys that are made it here to Northside today. We welcome you. We also welcome all of you who are joining us by live stream. And I just want to say... Our God reigns. You know, God knows the numbers of hairs that are on our head. He also created all the stars that we see in the sky, and he calls them by name. That is just awesome, just to even think about. Please stand as we sing our first song, Our God Reigns. You paint the night, you count the stars, and you call them by name. The skies proclaim, God, you reign. Your glory shines, you teach the sun when to bring a new day. Creation sings, God, you You part the seas, 
continue our worship here, please join us in singing Glorious Day. I learned a long time ago is that when we come to Christ and we experience his power and grace in our life, we begin a lifelong journey of growing into the likeness of him. I mean, it's not something that happens overnight. It's, there's a lot of missteps along the way. There are a lot of uh, setbacks that we cause that uh, cause us to back away. And yet there's always this inner desire within us to say, I just want to be what God wants me to be. I want to be what God created me to be. 
And I think that there's just so many wonderful passages of Scripture that we could turn to that reflect that. But one of my favorite is found in the longest chapter in the entire Bible, Psalm 119. And it says in verses 33 and following, Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow them to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the paths of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. I, what, a, what a joy it is to know that if we would just do those simple things that he's asking, the psalmist is asking for in that passage, that we would experience that full and meaningful life that God wants for every one of us. Let that be our prayer today, that as we worship, as we consider the, just the, the glory of who God is and the, the way that he wants to work in our lives, that we come to that place in our life where we say, God, teach me, train me, show me, take control of my heart. Because when you do, God, that's when my life is most blessed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we come into your presence just with thankful hearts, grateful, God, for all that you do in our lives. But God, we're so grateful for the instruction that you've given to us, for the leadership of your spirit to understand your word, for the hope and the purpose that you've given in all of our lives. Oh, God, I pray that we'll embrace that joyfully and that we'll fully follow you in all things. Let that be our desire today and every day that we live. For it's in your matchless name we pray. Amen.
I want to read you something from uh, Revelation chapter 21. This is one of my favorite verses. Uh, verse 4 in chapter 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death, grief, crying, and pain will no longer exist because previous things have passed away. What a day that's going to be. Please stand as we sing, What a Day That Will Be. short run, but it's an old one from, uh, you guys remember Andre Crouch. The name, the name of the song is called Through It All. And even though trials have, have come, they come only because our faith may be proved genuine. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6. And the name is called Through It All.
and just to lift our voices to him. Turn your Bibles with me. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 for our scripture reading here in just a few moments. You know, the other night I was watching a YouTube video. I don't know why we have cable in our house anymore because all the way out is YouTube, it seems like. And the other evening I was watching this video about Eric Mayer. I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly. This young man uh, was born with a disease called juvenile retinosis. And by the time he was 13 years old, he had gone totally blind. And it just, it was a remarkable young man. He just decided early on in that whole experience that he was not going to allow the limitations of the flesh to keep him from experiencing life the way that he wanted to experience life. And so he went out for his high school wrestling team. And not only did he become an avid wrestler, he became a very good wrestler, became the captain of the team, and eventually re represented his high school and the entire state in the National Freestyle Wrestling Championships. It's an amazing thing for a blind boy to be able to do that. 
Well, after he graduated from high school, he went off to Boston College and had a double major in English literature. And uh, 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 I don't remember what the second uh, major was. But anyway, he had a double major there, graduated with an education degree, and got a job at the prestigious Country Day School in Phoenix, Arizona. Taught middle school there. Well, he was an avid outdoorsman, and he decided... You know, one of the things that I want to do with my life is I've always wanted to be able to climb mountains. Well, you know, climbing mountains as a blind man, not very a good thing. There's a lot of pitfalls involved in it. There's a lot of pitfalls for anybody that's going to do that, obviously. But he went out and with a guide, of course, and he began to tackle some of the mountains around uh, Phoenix area. And he just began to climb some of those peaks and just found it to be so exhilarating for him. He couldn't stop there. He decided to take on a bigger mountain. The mountain that he chose to, to, to take on was in Alaska. It's called Denali. Okay, you're all familiar with that one, right? 20,000 plus feet. And he climbed it as a blind man clear to the top. Hmm. But that wasn't even all he wanted to do because on May 25th, 2001, he became the first blind person ever to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Now think about that. You know, a man with the obvious limitations and a lot of liabilities that you would think that would keep him from experiencing life, he decided, no, I'm not, not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'm going to live life to the fullest. He came home and he started an organization that's called No Barriers. And in that organization, he encourages people to kind of break through the personal barriers and things that are stopping them from move, moving forward in life. And they have this tagline as their motto. Maybe it sounds familiar to you. What's within you is stronger than what's in your way. When I first heard that, I thought, well, well wait a second. I read somebody else said that, something similar to that. As a matter of fact, the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 4, the one who is in you is greater than the ones who are in this world. And that's something that ought to be indel indelibly marked in the heart and life of every Christian. Think about that. We serve a God who is so powerful, who is so mighty, who is so capable that all of the forces of the world could come against us. Wouldn't matter. He's still greater than all of that, and he is alive and powerful in each one of us. And there's probably a good number of us this morning that could testify to that, right? I mean, we could think back to those moments in time when we looked at our life, and it just seemed like, you know, wow, how in the world am I going to get through this? And we got through it somehow because God was at work in us, doing something that only God could do, making a difference that only he could make. And he was changing the circumstance, changing us, changing all that was around us, enabling us, giving us power, strength, and all of the things that we just sang about. He's given us those things so that we can move forward in ministry for him. But you know, there's a lot of other people, believers, who for some reason or another have never come to that place in their life where they fully understood the joy of trusting their heart, their minds, their will, their everything over to God's hands and just allowing him to lead them in the way that they should go. And you know, when they fail to reach that level of spiritual maturity that we're talking about, that, that, that inability to trust God, that inability to look to him in the moments of crisis, in the moments of great joy, and every moment in between, they become easily disillusioned. And we have seen more than a few people who I believe have a love for Jesus, but because they haven't grown, because they haven't given themselves fully to him, because they've allowed the, the world to infiltrate into their life, become disillusioned to the point where they walk away from God. They walk away from his church. And when you would look at their life and compare it to people who don't know Jesus, it's hard to see any difference. Uh, you know, one of the things that Solomon wrote about in Proverbs was that there's a critical issue that each one of us need to face. And for the next few weeks, I think about the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about this, and we're going to use this morning's message as a launch pad for the things that we're talking about. We're talking about guarding our hearts and making sure that they're in the place and uh, used in the way that God wants them to be used and filled with the things that God wants them to be filled with. So this morning... 
in Proverbs chapter 4, Solomon uses these verses just to offer, in just a few short verses here, some, some powerful encouragements about how important it is that we do those things and live in that surrender to the indwelling presence of God in our life. Follow along with me as I read together with you Proverbs chapter 4, beginning with verse 20, and we'll read down through and include verse 27. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and a health to, those, uh, to, to a man's whole body. Above all, all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put, put perversity away from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze on what is directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only the ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Now I want to start here with this. I want you to, we'll just stop there. But I want us to start and think about what it is that we need to be doing as believers and followers of Christ to make sure that we're guarding our hearts. And I think the very first thing that we need to get, and we need to get this uh, very clearly in our life, is that we need to recognize the treasure that is our heart so that we will guard it carefully. We need to recognize the treasure that is in your heart. Now, if you're like me, when you're reading through that passage of Scripture, probably the words of verse 23 are the ones that just jump off the page at you. You know, they're, they're that, that passage that tells us that we need to guard our hearts. But there are two critical points that Solomon is making here that I think is very, are very important for us to get. The first thing that he says is, above all else, underline that. Keep that in your mind. Get that focus in your life because he is telling us, this guy who had more wisdom than anybody that's walked on this planet outside of the Lord, this man says that above all else, this is important, get this, and then at the end of it he says, guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. Everything about your life begins to flow out of that heart experience that you have. Know that. Understand that. Because that's true, make sure that you're doing everything in your power, everything that's possible to you, above all else, if you don't get anything else right. Get this. You need to guard your heart. Because I think that he understood the treasure that it is and the powerful hindrance it can be if we don't allow it to be given over completely to God. See, see, he understood this as the priority of our faith. And I don't know how oftentimes we think of it in those regards, but, but the, his own life experience could testify that. If you'd look at Solomon and watch his life and see in his early years his faithfulness to the Lord, his heart was given over to God, everything was right for him, and God was just pouring blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing into his life. It was a wonderful experience. And through that blessing that was in Solomon's life, it was just overflowing into the life of the nation and people were being changed. I mean, it was just a great time, probably one of the most glorious times in all of Israel's history. But at the end of his life, things began to change. See, his heart was turned. It was turned away from God and the things of God, and as a result of that, all of those blessings, all of those joys, all of that wonder that God had brought to his life early in his life now has faded away. And he's telling us from my own experience, he knew that. He could say, guard your heart. This is more important than anything else because everything else out of your life begins to flow from that. It's the, it's the wellspring from all else, from all, everything else that flows from your life. You know, uh, obviously, you know, when we're talking about our hearts, we're not talking about that muscle in your body that's pumping blood and doing all those kinds of things. But it's a part of that being that is our core. It's where our morality comes from. It's our ethics. It's where what's important to us and what, what drives us forward and what encourages us and, and what keeps us close to God or draws us away from God. It's our emotions, our will. And, and because it drives our lives, when we come to Christ and we experience his redeeming grace in our life, we, we need to give that heart over to him. In Ezekiel chapter 36, God made a promise to his people. And this was kind of an interesting promise. He said that he would give them a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now, I thought I read that. I'm thinking, wow, before I came to Christ, I had a heart of stone? Is that what he's saying? My will was so uh, uh, wrapped up in things that are opposed to God that it was almost like there was no tenderness for God or no tenderness for the things of God in my life? 
And I thought about it, yeah, that's exactly who I was. That's exactly the way my life was. And that's exactly the way every other unbeliever's life is. They don't have any tenderness to God, but when they come to Christ, he begins to change that. Mark chapter 7, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. And in that passage of Scripture, he said, from within, men's, from, from within out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. When we think about all those things that are at the core of our being when we come to Christ, it's a really good understanding why we need that spiritual heart transplant that he gives us. And so Ezekiel said, we put all that together, and he says, God's going to reach into your life, and he's going to take out that old heart of stone, and he's going to give you a new one, a heart of flesh, a heart that's tender for the things of God. A heart that can rejoice with others when they rejoice and grieve with them when they grieve and celebrate the greatness of God. A heart that can reach out to God with worship. A heart that will make a difference for you and for others around you. But be careful because everything influences our heart and it needs to be guarded carefully. Now, I want you to know there's some residual here that we need to pick up on. We need to make sure, you know, I can imagine, I mean, I've, I've, you know, imagine someone that has had a heart transplant and all of the, the care that they would have to take physically to make sure that they're, they're uh, uh, maintaining the health of that heart and making sure that everything is uh, proper for them and, and knowing that things are not exactly as they used to be, but things might be better for them in the future, but they have to be very careful about that. Well, there's some residual. When we live with Christ in our life, the worldliness that used to seem just fine doesn't seem so fine anymore. You know, um, uh, there were a lot of times in our life when we did things that everybody else was doing. It just seemed like the right thing to do. They were happy with it. We were happy with it. We had no qualms about it. But now with this new heart, somehow purity, holiness, righteousness that comes from God is at our core. And, and, And suddenly those things, they don't make us comfortable anymore. God has given us a new direction, a new will, a new desire, a new hope, a new purpose. All of these things. But we need to be very, very careful. Because, you see, it's right at this point when we understand the joy of walking in Jesus that you see a lot of Christians, maybe you can relate to this, begin to lose their way a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's the old influences of our life, and they start working on us, and they start calling us back. And we look at them at first, and they're repulsive to us, and we don't want to have to do that. I say, no, no, there's nothing but pain there. There's nothing but sorrow. There's nothing but sadness. I'm not going back to that, but, but they're still there. And they keep drawing us, and they do everything in their power to continue to influence us and draw us back, calling us to that life that we used to live. And the deceiver, he's going to be working among us and around us and through us and around people that are influencing in our life, and he's going to say, it's okay. Everybody else is doing it. And they seem to be fine. They're living good lives. It's not like it's going to be the end of all things for you. Come on back. It's okay. And then he'll even go to that extreme and he'll point out some people that you know are believers. Maybe people that you go to church with. Maybe people who are in your small group. And he points to them and he says, look at them. They're doing it too. And all the while he's trying to influence us to come back to him. And at this point, we have to be unbelievably careful not to allow the influence and the habits of our old life to come in and begin to override the joy of our new hearts. Because if we do, we're going to be right back to the same place that we were before. It sounds contradictory, doesn't it? I mean, when you think about it, I have a new heart And that new heart is for Jesus. It beats for Jesus, right? It's the very core of my being. I told you that earlier. I said this is what what drives us. This is what moves us forward. It influences everything about our life. And yet, how in the world can I, with this brand new heart that beats for Jesus, that drives forward for him, how can I be influenced by the things of the world? But one of the things we also need to understand is that we know that very often in our life, that heart, that core of our being, constantly being being impacted by the things of the world will draw us away if we allow it to continue to exist within us. There was an old um, computer uh, slang, I guess, or adage, I guess maybe would be a better way of putting it, that people used to say years and years ago. When computers, personal computers first came out and people were frightened by them and wondering how in the world they're gonna manage, one of the things we were told, if you put garbage in a computer, 
What do you get out? Garbage in, garbage out. That's just the way it works, right? We understand it. Well, let me say something, friends. Garbage in your heart, garbage is coming out of your heart. Because out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. Your life lives. It's the wellspring of everything that you are, right? We know that. So if you allow the world, even as a believer, if you allow the world to come in and be the primary influence in your heart and give direction to your heart and give leadership to your heart, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be just like the world. You're going to be acting like the world. You're going to have the world's attitude. You're going to have the world's values. All of the things of the world are going to be in you because you've allowed that to exist in you when God says, you know, i got a better way for you. So Solomon comes to us and he says, listen, above all else, guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. So how do we do that? I mean, that's the big question. I mean, how are we going to get to that point where we do it? Now, I'm going to cut to the chase right from the beginning, and then we'll kind of back up here and decide how we're going to get this done. To guard your heart, you need to fill it with God's Word. To guard your heart, you need to fill it with God's Word. There's absolutely no substitute for that, none whatsoever. Let's try to put what Solomon's saying to us here in context. I need you to look back in your Bible some verses that maybe we didn't put on the screen earlier. Notice in verse 13, if you have your Bibles open, look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 13. He says, hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. First question comes to mind. You look at that verse and say, what instruction is he talking about? Hold on to instruction. Okay, I need to hold it on to it, but what is that? Solomon was raised in a Hebrew family. And he was writing this letter primarily to Hebrews. And the Jewish people knew something from the word of God and from the will of God from the past, that there was an instruction that needed to be passed down generationally. It was called the Shema. It was a responsibility that the father had to his children to train them in the ways of God. But not only to train them in the ways of God, to model obedience to those things with his own life, his own actions, his own words, everything about him, he was to model obedience to the word of God, and he was to represent that to his children so that his children would accept those values, understand the importance of them, and they too could begin to live in obedience to God. So when Solomon spoke to these people and wrote this down, and he said, you know, hang on to instruction, you know what he's telling them? Hang on to that obedience that your father taught you. Hang on to that faithfulness that your father showed you in his own life. Hang on to this. They knew exactly what kind of instruction they were talking about. And so I say to you this morning the same thing. You know, you know the truth of God. Most of you have been in church for a long, long time in your life, and you understand the the, the principles of God's word and how valuable they are. Hang on to them. Hang on to them tight. Because if you don't, life can really be messed up in a hurry for us. Uh, Go back, let's go back, don't stop there. Go back to verse 20 in your Bibles. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them. Now, I want to make sure we get this right, and I want to make sure everybody gets the understanding that Solomon's providing for us. In verse 13, and then again in verse 22 of these, this passage of Scripture, Solomon says that the instruction that we receive in the ways of God is, and I quote, your life and life to those who find them. Now, let me put this in a way that I think we might be able to all relate to and hang on to. We need to know what's true. And we need to hang on to it like our life depends on it, because it does. Now, I grew up in a manhood in Walter Cronkite's America. You remember that? I would go at 5.30 at night, not every night, but many nights, I would turn on the television to the CBS channel that Walter Cronkite was on, and I would listen to the news. Now, but in those days, I don't think the words... Fake news had ever been uttered. I I don't think it was ever heard of in those days. We just trusted that Walter Cronkite was going to give us a fair and impartial, unbiased telling of that day's events. And at the end of the day, he'd say, and that's the way it is, right? And that's the way it was. We accepted that as truth, and we embraced that. Well, you know, those are bygone days in our world today. Now, the reality is we can view all the information that comes to our life, whatever source it is, whether it's from the right or the left or in between, and we always view it with a little bit of skepticism. 
because we're not so sure that what we're getting is a fair and impartial and or imbalanced telling of what's really true. It always seems to be skewed a little bit by the position that someone has politically. And so we want to stay away from those kinds of things. Think about how that works with God's Word, because it's truth there, too. There are a lot of heresies in this world. I'm not telling you anything new there, am I? Because the reality is heresies have existed in the Christian world from the time, uh, since the time that, that the, the serpent told Eve, go ahead and eat that fruit because it's not really going to kill you even though God says that it will. And heresies have continued to exist right up to this very day. And what we need to know is if we're hanging on to the truth, we can understand what's heresy and what's really real. But the only way that we can do that is to fill our hearts, our minds, our lives with the Word of God, the eternal truth of God. And when we do that, God is going to make a real difference in our life. Because let me look at the thing about this way. Do you think that a heart that's filled with the foolishness of this world, with the evil of this world, with the misconceptions and the heresies that are represented in this world, is that where life is going to be flowing from? I mean, real talking about real life, spiritual life, life that lasts into eternity, is that where that's going to be flowing from? I don't think so. I think real life, the kind of life that God wants to bring to people, the kind of life that he wants the Christians to exhibit with our uh, being in this flesh, is filled with his love and his compassion and, and his hope for mankind. And all of those things come from God who brings them to us by his word, through his spirit, and as we stand together unified as one. So if you're going to guard your heart, it means that we're going to do everything that we can to nourish the nature that we have from Christ and starve the old nature that we got from Adam. We've got to do that. Nourish the nature that we got from Christ. Fill it up with the Word of God. Starve that nature that we got from Adam. So if we've defined our heart as the core of our being, the essence of who we are, and we realize that we need to fill it, guard it carefully, filling it with God's Word, keeping it from the evil of this world, well, one might think that the very best next step for us to take is to you know, kind of separate ourselves, isolate ourselves, keep us from being influenced by the world. But let me tell you, I want to share with you what guarding your heart doesn't mean. Okay, This is important, and I want you to get it. You know, it's possible that somebody has the best intentions of, of all. They, they just think things through. They, 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 they work at their life, and they realize that, you know, they say, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to be faithful to what God has called me to. I want to be the person, the man that God wants me to be. In every way, and the only way that I can guard my heart and make sure that the influences of the world are not there for me is to kind of sequester myself. You know, kind of like the old monks did in the old days, you know, and they'd isolate themselves from the world and they wouldn't see all of the things that were going on. They wouldn't experience all of the influences of the world. Hear my heart when I say this, friends. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus in your life brings you to salvation and presents you to the world as a messenger of his love and hope for all mankind. And that's not possible if you sequester yourself, if you isolate yourself and say, I don't want to be worried about having to deal with the influence of the world. I'm just going to keep to myself. And God speaks to us and says, well, wait a second. You know, my love for the world didn't end with you. And my desire for reconciliation with all of the loss of this world didn't end with you. As a matter of fact, now that you've come to me, I want to use you and your uniqueness and, 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 and the, the glory that is in your life and as a testimony to what I can do for others. And I want you to live out your life as a testimony. I want you to show my love to them. I want them to see the compassion that I have for them and the forgiveness that's readily available to them. I want them to see it through you. And that means we've got to get out into the world. And guess what's going to happen? I mean, sometimes you're going to get bumped. Sometimes things aren't going to work out so well. But you need to understand that guarding your heart doesn't mean that you protect yourself from all hurt. It means you protect yourself from all sin, whatever it costs. Now, that's the problem that we have sometimes, right? I don't want to get hurt. And the best way I know not to get hurt is to kind of stay inclusive, 
You know, I just be here with our little, you know, the, the old preacher's at it just for no more, that kind of attitude. No, it doesn't work anymore. Never did, really. We need to be reaching out to the lost of this world. We need to be demonstrating to them that Christ loves them through our love for them. We need to show that he forgives them through our forgiveness of their sin. We need to, you know, whatever we can do to represent Christ, we're his ambassadors. We need to make that real in our life. The fuller context of this passage of Scripture is telling us that we need to retain the wise teaching of Christ so that we can stand against the evil desires of the flesh so that the justification that God has brought to our life can be represented to a world all around us. See, God's intent for the Jewish nation originally was that he would pour blessing into them. It would flow out of them so much that all of the nations of the world would be blessed. Well, you and I are the representatives of God in this New Testament world we live in. And he wants to pour blessing into your life after blessing into your life after blessing into your life so it can fill you up, flow out of you, and be a blessing to those that are around you. How can that be unless we're willing to open our hearts and open our eyes and open our lives to the people that are around us? I read something C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Four Loves, and I thought it was kind of interesting. I wanted to share it with you. He said, there's no safe investment when it comes to our hearts. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you need to give your heart to no one. Wrap it up carefully with hobbies and little luxuries, but avoid all entanglements. Lock it in a safe place, like in a casket of your own selfishness. But remember, in that dark, safe, motionless casket, it'll change. Oh, it won't be broken. It will become unbreakable. But it will also become unyielding, impenetrable, irredeemable, cold to us, and worthless to others. Friends, I want you to guard your hearts. I really do think we should keep ourselves pure from the things of this world resist evil do everything that you can to fill your heart with God's word and God's presence and God's life let it be seen in you through the the actions the word the the the, the attitudes of your life let that fullness of God that the world needs desperately to see be seen in you but don't get to that place in your life where you become so so fearful, so worrisome about what might happen if you put your heart out there, how it might get trampled on, how you might get offended, how, you, how it might get broken. Don't worry about those things because God is still the great healer. And he can heal your heart. And when we put ourselves out there, we represent Christ to a lost and dying world who are so overcome by the sins of this world that they think this is exactly the way that we're living. This is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And Satan has deceived them that they don't see where the road they're on ends. And I read somewhere, you have too, that it's called a broad road that leads to destruction. Friends, don't let that be for your family, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, for the students that you go to school with. Don't let it be that for them. Be a light, a witness for Christ in those places. Guard your heart, yes, but put your heart out there and love abundantly, joyfully, fully. And watch what God does in your life, given over to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you bring to us. Thank you, God, for the privilege that we have to experience life the way that you always intended for it to be for us. Thank you, God, that, that you are able to see past our sin and unholiness and, and find something that you could love, Lord, and you sent Jesus to die for our sins so that we might be redeemed. God, we live in a world that's unholy and blackened and, and, and blackened by sin in so many different ways, and we understand that there are all kinds of false truths out there that are trying to draw us away from you. But help us, dear God, help us to fill our lives up with you. And each day as it passes, Lord, we can look back and say, I've become more and more and more like Jesus. That's exactly what you want. We know that. 
But when we become like Jesus, we also need to become people who bear his attitude. Jesus who came to seek and to save those who were lost. And God, let that be the passion of our heart, Lord. It's not just that we're full of you, it's so we're full of you so that we can share you with others. You're the greatest treasure of our life, Lord, and we recognize that and we want to share you and your, your, the tre- that treasure with others. Oh God, just give us that heartfelt passion today. Walk alongside of us and Use us in your will. Maybe there's somebody here, though, God, that's looking at their life saying, you know, I've, I've really got hung up on some things in this world, and I, I'm having a hard time letting them go. Father, use this time. Lord, maybe they just need to come and surrender their life to you, and others will come alongside of them and, and, and pray for them and encourage them and love them and, 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 and be a shield of faith for them. Lord, maybe there's somebody else that's here that's saying, you know what, I, I need Jesus the way you're talking about. I, you know, I've heard about his redeeming grace. I've heard people talk about his abiding love. I've heard talk, people say that they've experienced the indwelling uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. They just haven't, I haven't felt it. Lord, I pray that this morning during this time of decision and invitation, they'll be courageous enough to come and and into their heart receive you as Savior and Lord of their lives because you can change everything for them. We know that. Lord, they might not know how to do that, but if they'll be courageous enough to come, Lord, we can show them how. And today, this day, they can be forever born again into your spirit. Oh, God. Maybe there's some other need here that I haven't mentioned, but your spirit is just speaking to the hearts of people right now. You're laying your burden upon them, God. You're saying, this is what I want for you. Help us to hear you. Help us to obey you. Help us choose to choose faithfulness over everything else to you today. God, use this time. We ask these things for your sake for the sake of the lost around us, and for us and for your church. Bless us now. Amen. I want you to stand with me. We're going to have this time of invitation. We're going to sing some words together as we sing this song. You listen to what Jesus is saying to you. I'll be moving down here to the front. I'll be happy to receive you as you come and share your need. Whatever I can do to help you and pray with you, I'll be glad to do that. But Whatever God's saying to you this morning, you be willing to come. Give your heart, your life to Jesus. Trust him. Trust his ways this morning. As we sing, you come.
I was thinking about how important it is that place in our life where we say, you know, God, I want you to really to have your way with me. I want you to direct my life. I want you to, to be the, the one who fills me, who guides me, who directs me. But I got to ask you, I mean, it just seems like the, the right time, the appropriate time for us to say, what is filling your heart today? What have you allowed into your heart today? Because you see, it's only your surrender to God that's going to change that. It's only when you come back to the Lord and say, God, that, that, that garbage that's there, I don't want it there. Help me to cleanse my heart from that. David, uh, you know, this great king of, of Israel whose heart was perfect at the heart of the Lord, he had that problem in his own life, and he came before God, and he said, create in me a new heart. Man, I messed the old one up. His plea was, God, you've got to fix what's wrong, and the only way I can do that is through confessing my sin, acknowledging that, and moving away from it in repentance. Are you ready to make that decision for Christ? We're going to sing the next verse of the song, and as you sing, listen to what Jesus is saying. Maybe you need to make that decision. God, create in me a new, clean heart, one that's purposely given over to you. Just real quickly, let me take a couple of moments just to share with you some important announcements that we have. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to those of you who have already donated to Summer Eats out in the uh, foyer there next to the office doors. There's a little table that's been set up, and, and uh, we're asking people to make donations of individually individual sized cups of fruit or applesauce that's going to be used with United Way effort to help uh, uh, feed children uh, through the summer months, and giving them a free lunch uh, every day. And so uh, uh, it's just our way of coming alongside with other churches to make that possible. And so if you want to bring a donation, you can bring it anytime. Just set it on that table, and we will take care of it from there. We'll get it to the process points. And, and throughout this summer month, there's going to be opportunities for kids to eat because uh, they may not have that opportunity uh, without the, the help of the, the churches in the United Way. Also, let me just remind you that camp registration is underway. Uh, there's a link in our app. All you got to do is go to down to the where it says Bounce, which is the theme of camp. Click on that, and it'll take you right to the registration page. You can go to our website, uh, northsidedixon.com, and do the same thing. It'll take you right to the registration page. You can register. Just a quick reminder choose the cash option because the association and the, and the church are going to be paying part of that uh, fee and your total fee for going to camp is only going to be $60 per student. There are some limited number of scholarships available. We don't want money to be an issue for anybody going to camp and so if you need one of those, please let me know and if you register, please let me know. I kind of have, have to have an idea about how many from Northside are going. We, uh, IBSA when they register, they don't just automatically send that information out. So if you can let let me know. I would appreciate it very, very much, and uh, we'd welcome that as well. Don't forget that tonight at 6 o'clock is going to be our quarterly business meeting, and we'd like for you to be here if you're a member of the church and you want to, uh, you know, help us in setting this tone for the direction that we're going in the next uh, few months. Uh, we encourage you to be here. We're going to be sharing with you some reports about some things that have been go going on and then some strategies that we have as we move forward. So please be here 6 o'clock tonight. Probably won't take more than three or four hours, and you'll have good. No, <laughs> just kidding. We're going we're gonna to be together, and we're going to conduct the Lord's business together, and hope you'll be here and be a part of that. And then, of course, just remind you that life groups are meeting through the week. You have opportunities to connect with these small groups, and we hope that you are. If not, uh, please consider doing that. There's information about that, on the, again, on the app and on the website. You can go there and get information about that, or see me after the service. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll be glad to help you with that. And then, of course, we have our midweek Bible study for adults at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night as well. Uh, and the youth are meeting at 6.30 on Wednesday night, so you have an opportunity to meet with them. Anybody have any words they'd like to share before we close? <coughs> Thank you. 
We're going to spray these kids down with Lysol? All right. I want to be the guy that gets to do that. (laughs) All right. Any other words? God is wonderful. Yeah, I tricked you you there, didn't I? You expect me to say good. He is wonderful all the time, too. Stand with me. We're going to have a closing hymn, and, and then Marty will dismiss us. God's wonderful people.